In this video, we're going to discuss the derivative of an exponential function. So let's get right down to it. The derivative of the exponential function b to the x is ln of b times b to the x. ln of b is our notation for the logarithm base e, or what is known as the natural logarithm. Now, we're not in a position to prove this rigorously. And in fact, the more traditional and rigorous route is to first define the natural logarithm uh, via integration, and then um, you work from there. But our sequence of videos has been going through the differential calculus first, and we'd really like to use the exponential function for examples and applications. So we really want to talk about it now and not wait for later. So what we'll do is we'll prove what we can, and we'll use empirical evidence to make the rest of the argument plausible. And by the way, we'll review laws of exponents and exponential functions themselves which is actually a good thing to do, especially in the context of new calculus topics that we know. So one thing to observe here, or recall perhaps, is that Euler's number e, which is about 2.72, rounded to two decimal places, is a very special number that appears all throughout mathematics in a number of different ways. For us right now, we'll just point out that you can look at the exponential function base e, so that's e to the x, and it is an invertible function, and so its inverse is the logarithm base e, and that's usually written as ln of x, so that's really meant to represent the log base e. So this is the inverse of the exponential function base e. And remember that the to say that b to the x equals y is equivalent to saying that the log base b of y is x. This is nothing more or less than stating what an inverse function does. Now one thing to notice is e to the one being e implies, and is, equival is equivalent to, in fact, the, uh, the statement that the log base e of e is 1, or ln of e is 1. Now, since ln of e is 1, that means there's a very special case to look at here. The derivative of e to the x, with respect to x, is going to be ln of e, e to the x, but ln of e is 1, and therefore this derivative is just e to the x. So the exponential function e to the x has this very special property that it is its own derivative. So this law of um, derivatives for exponential functions is what we'd like to, we'd like to prove it, but we're not going to be able to prove it. So let's just discuss it a little bit. And before we do that, what we should do is just review what it means to exponentiate something. So here we have this expression b to the x, and we want to think of this as a function of x. And first of all, this number b, this constant, the base, we're going to assume that the base is greater than zero. You can actually use negative numbers for your base, but then you have to be really careful about uh, the domain of your exponents. So we're just going to assume that all our bases are positive. And we're just going to point out that there's an exponential function for each choice of base. So an exponential function, we're really thinking of a whole family of exponential functions for all the different positive numbers you could choose. Now the x here in this expression, you should really think of this as the argument of the exponential function. The domain of an exponential function is the set of all real numbers. That's actually a sort of deep statement, so we're going to have more to say about that in a few minutes. All right, so laws of exponents. These are really familiar to us. We know that b to the x plus y is equal to b to the x b to the y. And we know that b to the x y is equal to b to the x raised to the y. Now these statements are more or less obvious whenever your exponents, x and y, are natural numbers, the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, etc. You can just sort of look at a few examples and convince yourself that this is going to work whenever x and y are natural numbers. So we've got these properties that work certainly when x and y are natural numbers. Now, we're going to make some definitions. What does it mean to take b to the 0? Well, we're going to define that quantity to be 1. And the reason we do that is to make sure that these two uh, previous properties, the laws of exponents, continue to hold. Um, there's only one choice for our definition. And similarly here, b to the negative 1 has to be defined to be the reciprocal of b. b to the negative x, well, if the second law of exponents above holds, then this is the same as b to the x to the negative 1, which, to be consistent with the previous line, has to be the reciprocal of b to the x. So here we have this collection of definitions, 
And the thing to notice is that now we've been able to um, expand our notion of what it means to raise something to a power. Now our exponents can be integers, and you can work this out, but these laws of exponents at the top, these top two lines, continue to hold when x and y are integer valued. And we're going to keep plunging ahead here. We're going to make further definitions. So if q is a natural number, what does it mean to take b and raise it to the 1 over q? So whatever we define this to be, if our goal is to keep those top two lines continuing to be true, then certainly this has to be true. b to the 1 over q raised to the q is the same as b to the 1, because 1 over q times q is 1. So that means that this quantity right here, b to the 1 over q, it's the thing whose qth power is b. Um, we interpret that to be the qth root of b. We could take this as a definition. So b to the 1 over q is the qth root of b. Now, suppose p is an integer. So we're going to have b to the p over q. And what are we going to define this to be? Well, there's really only one choice. Once again, we're going to keep the laws, the first two lines, um, we want them to continue to be true. So there's only one way to define this. It's got to be b to the 1 over q raised to the p, which of course then is the qth root of b raised to the p. Or if you like, you could have gone the other way and said it's the qth root of the quantity b to the p. But in any case now, again, what we've done is we, we've expanded our definition of, of what it means to raise something to an exponent now. Every rational number can be written as a quotient p over q, where q is a natural number and p is any old integer. So what this means is we now have a way of calculating b raised to any rational number. So we've now expanded our definition to include x and y, any rational numbers. And these laws of exponents, you can check, continue to hold true. So here we are. We have, at the moment, we've defined b to the x. It's got domain q as a function of x. We can exponentiate anything rational. And we also know that the laws of exponents work for rational exponents. But, you know, there are a lot of other kinds of numbers. So let's just take 2 to the x. We'll take the base 2 for an example. And you could raise 2 to various natural numbers, the most primitive sort of exponentiation. We understand that. And, of course, 2 to the 0 has to be 1. 2 to the negative 1 is a half, and so on. We could use some negative integers. Pick some of your favorite rational numbers, and you can calculate some roots and powers of those roots and some negative rational numbers as well. And a picture really starts to take shape here of what the graph of this function to the x looks like. And in fact, if you were to plot a whole bunch of these, you would get um, sort of a dusty curve. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you only are allowing yourself to exponentiate rational numbers, there have to be holes because there are plenty of irrational numbers. We know this, you know, great examples are root 2 pi and negative 1 over root 3. So we don't have a definition for these yet, so we can't actually just naively say what these things are given our discussion on previous slides. If we really want to understand what's going on, what does it mean to raise 2 to the x power when x is irrational, we're going to have to invoke some calculus. So here's what we're going to do. Let's just take 2 to the pi, for instance. And what we're going to do is Pi is not a rational number, but we can sneak up to pi using rational numbers. We can find a sequence of rational numbers that converges to pi. And then hopefully when we do that, once we find the values of 2 to the x for these rational values of x, the values themselves start sneaking up on some sort of limiting value, and that's what will define 2 to the pi to be. So you can just try this yourself. You can, you can look at a sequence of rational numbers that converges to pi. And a really silly way to do this is just to take the decimal expansion and chop it off after a number of places. And you will get a sequence of rational numbers. And this sequence of rational numbers converges to pi. Now, we sort of quote unquote know what it means to take the uh, two raised to these powers. So we can do that, and you can watch as the values of these expressions get closer and closer to a limiting value. And so what we do is we define 2 to the pi to be this limiting value. So here are some deep facts. Q is dense in R. And what I mean by that is any irrational number you pick in the real number line can be approximated by a sequence of rational numbers that converges to it. Just think of its decimal expansion and chop it off at various places to get such a sequence. When x is irrational, the value of b to the x is, you can think of it as the continuous completion of an algebraic process that we understand. So we know what it means to take 2 and raise it to 
a rational power. So if you're wondering what it means to take two raised to an irrational power, just think of it as being sort of a continuity argument. You're just sort of looking at this graph on the left and seeing what you're led to by sort of a continuous process. And of course, this begs the question, once you've defined b to the x for all these arbitrary values of real numbers, b to the x is in fact a continuous function on r. Now if you look at the family of exponential functions for different bases, you'll notice that when the base is between 0 and 1, you get a decreasing function. b equals 1 is not very interesting, and then once you get beyond 1, you get to be increasing. Now, we could have frozen the dial there at b equals 1. That's just the constant function 1. That's not very interesting. But any base between 0 and 1 is decreasing. Any base between 1 and infinity is increasing. OK, so let's look at the definition of derivative of an arbitrary function. The derivative of f of x is going to be, let's use the sort of so-called h form of this definition, limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Now in our example, we'd like to study the case where f of x equals b to the x. So let's swap these out. We've got b to the x and b to the x plus h and b to the x. So this is the expression we'd like to understand. Now it's going to be worth considering a special case. Let's look at the tangent slope at x equals 0. So we're saying, what is the derivative of b to the x when x is 0? Now you plug in 0 for x and you get this expression right here. Now let's just box this and put this aside. We're going to need this later. But let's keep moving on with the general calculation. Now we know the law of exponents tells us that b to the x plus h is equal to b to the x, b to the h. So we're going to take this expression and swap that out using the law of exponents. Now next, we're going to notice that there's a b to the x common to both these terms in the numerator, so we can just factor that out. And now we're looking at this expression. Now here's an important observation. As a function of h, b to the x is constant. So let's just remember what that means. We've got b to the x, and you've chosen an argument x, and you'd like to find the tangent slope there. So the intermediate step is to choose a variable h, which tells you how far away from that argument to step. Then you'll be able to evaluate the function at x plus h. You can calculate a secant slope. And then the issue is what happens as you take the limit as h goes to 0. So what's changing in this picture? It's the parameter h, which tells you how far away from x you step. So x is actually anchored, and it's this other point that sneaks up on x. So x is constant and therefore b to the x is constant, which means that this can be brought out of the limit entirely because for the purposes of that limit, it's just a constant. So there's a great simplifying step. So now at this moment we have that the derivative of b to the x, putatively, we've calculated it so far, and we find that it's b to the x times this limit. Now let's just note something. b to the h, we could, for whatever reason, rewrite it as b to the 0 plus h. And 1, by the way, is b to the 0. So if we substitute those in, seemingly making it more complicated, we will notice that what we have looks very familiar. We're going to bring back this tangent slope at the origin. That's what this quantity is on the right, this limit here. So we're going to just sort of separate this out, and we'll notice that the derivative of b to the x is apparently b to the x times this limit, which is the tangent slope at x equals 0. So let's actually switch notations. Let's go back to this functional notation with f of x. So what this is saying here is f prime of x is equal to the original function f of x times this constant f prime of 0, the derivative of b to the x at 0. Now let's just put the constant on the other side because usually we like to have constants floating out front. Now, this is just a remarkable statement, because what it's saying is, if f is differentiable at the argument 0, then in fact, f is differentiable at any x. That's what this statement says to us. So we, we don't know how to prove that f prime of 0 is anything in particular at the moment, but we, but we can at least use this statement to see that if it's just differentiable at the origin, then it's got to be differentiable everywhere, and that's more or less a direct consequence of the laws of exponents, which is a remarkable fact. So where does that leave us? We have this tangent slope at the origin problem. So if you just look at various exponential functions using different bases, 
it sure looks like a tangent slope exists in each case. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna simply assume that this is true, that the exponential functions b to the x are differentiable at the origin always. And we're just gonna assume that's true. And we'll notice that the slope changes as the base changes, which is no shock. And so what we wanna do is we want, to we want to examine this limiting value which we can simplify back to this quantity. And we'd like to know how this slope, this quantity here, depends on the base B. So what we're gonna do next is a little experimental calculus. We're just gonna use uh, some software to poke around with exponential functions and try to figure out what's going on, our hypothesis is that this limit exists for all positive b, and we'd like to gather numerical evidence as to how this quantity depends on b. Now, if h is relatively close to zero, then you should be able to get by with this kind of approximation. If h is pretty close to zero, we should just be able to calculate b, of h, b to the h minus one over h to give us this approximation. So take your favorite spreadsheet and what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate this approximate tangent slope of b to the x at the origin for various bases. Now, we said that we should be able to get this approximation pretty good if h is relatively close to zero, so let's use, say, 0 0.001. It's an arbitrary choice, but it'll do, and we just need a good approximation. So we're gonna have a column that has all our bases filled in. So let's just pick, say, bases from 0 0.1 to 2.0 and we can fill that in in our column. Now we're gonna have another column that calculates the approximate tangent slope using this formula. So let's click in here to a cell, and we're gonna calculate this limit. So we're gonna take the value of the cell to the left, which is giving us our base, and we'll raise it to the 0 0.001 and subtract off one and divide by 0 0.001. And when we hit enter, we find that this approximate tangent slope at the origin is about negative 2.3. Now we've calculated this uh, formula and what we can do is select and drag down and we'll get our whole collection of approximate tangent slopes at the origin as you vary the base B. Now what we'd like to do next is understand how to take the base uh, data and figure out how the approximate tangent slope changes as a function of that base. So the question is, what does this relationship look like? It certainly looks like when uh, the base is close to zero, we're getting some negative numbers and they're increasing, they're eventually positive. We'd like to have a little more quantitative handle on what's going on. So this is a cool trick. You can select and copy a group of table data from your favorite spreadsheet and move over into Desmos and just paste it into a cell and it'll give you a nice uh, data set. And there we go, we've got this beautiful graph of our data. Remember the horizontal axis is our base and the vertical axis is the approximate tangent slope to the graph of the function b to the x for that base at the origin. And boy, this looks a lot like ln of x. Could that possibly be true? Well, we can easily test this by using Desmos and just plugging in the formula ln of x and then hitting enter and you get your graph and boy, that fit looks good. It sure looks like the tangent slope at the origin of the function y equals b to the x turns out to be ln of b. And this is a deep fact. So the limit of h goes to zero, b to the h minus one over h is in fact the natural log of b. Now, once you have that fact in hand, we, you can complete the calculation from earlier. We were at this point, we had figured out that the derivative of b to the x is going to be whatever this limiting value is times b to the x. Of course, we've just gathered the evidence to suggest that limiting value really should be ln of b. And so here we are with our law for finding the derivative of an exponential function. Once again, this wasn't a proof but we sure gathered some compelling evidence using uh, Spreadsheet and Desmos.